I worry as I grow older, I won't be able to ride the scooter anymore, right? And how can we give mobility and independence to people as we grow older? And to be able to be independent, go to where I am and not be stressed. Let's step back and look at technology and how it has used, how it has helped us. What was the first uh, technology that we have been using? If you look at our ancestors, the cavemen, for example, right? We use our bare hands to use tools such as this, hammers, raw force. Then we observe nature, right? If I have a long stick, I can amplify my force, right? And then use the creativity of the human mind to see how mechanical advantage by using things around us, I can have more muscular force to engage in my everyday living. So life certainly has improved. After that, the invention of the steam power, right? Because my arm, my muscle is not strong enough. Can I use steam, burn coal? Coal generates power to heat up water. Water makes into steam, and steam pushes pistons to turn the, the engine and to make the wheels turn on a train. Or electricity, can I make it such that I push a button? Things move, right? So I don't need to be very powerful in, anymore. So that gave birth to the machines. The first, perhaps, the most, when in our lifetime, the Industrial Revolution. And it certainly has helped us a lot. We take for granted how these machines have helped us. Everyday things, but life will be so hard. Imagine life without an air conditioner. Imagine life without hot water where you're taking a bath. How do you keep your food without a refrigerator, right? So we have things like this. But it's not only about physically helping us. It's hard to do mathematics, right? To compute, right? It'd be nice if I go grocery shopping. I know I want to spend $30. Have I spent enough $30? Because up, after spending $30, I get a $5 rate or something like that. <laughs> I want to maximize it. So now people built mechanical computers. Remember the abacus to help us, right? And perhaps something like this in the lower left, an adding machine, mechanical. So it's also helping us in our cognitive capability, right? And the first computer, perhaps big computers, and that really is the birth of the second revolution, I would say, in my lifetime, perhaps, or my parents' lifetime, is the computers, right? IT revolution. But what's our computers? They just do computations, right? Moving things around. Ah, no, not moving things around, moving data around. Who invented the computer? I don't remember exactly who. I should, I should know. But perhaps the inventor of the computer submitted the proposal with the objective of, I need to build a machine to help me do heavy mathematical computations. Yeah? Scientific computations, it's very hard for the human to do. Long additions, subtractions, computations, modeling, right? Good, it serves the purpose. But when I was your age, I was using the computer for what? Not scientific computations, word processing in the 1980s. Can you imagine word processing? Before we type documents, she's a typewriter. Very careful, we made a mistake. We blanco it, we white it out. Can you imagine life without word processing? It's so hard, right? 1980s. Certainly not scientific computations. 1990s, what? Internet, communications, games. Can you imagine if the inventor said, give me money, I want to build a machine to play games. Give me money, I want to build a machine to do word processing. Give me machines so I can write letters and communicate with people. That will be thrown out. Today, 2000s, Twitter, Facebook, all this other stuff, WhatsApp, it's really availability of knowledge and data to us. Right? I'm very happy with my new computer, my new acquisition, the lower right. It's a tablet and, and, and notebook. I can even take out the, the tablet, right? It's like having two computers in one. Right? So physical assistance, Cognitive assistance is great, right? But what is the real impact? What's the next step, right? We are starting to see the next step in combining industrial machines, industrial revolution, the IT revolution together to give cognitive capabilities, thinking capabilities to these washing machines, all these machines that we take for granted everyday life, right? So that's the automatic machine. Can we have a machine to do some sequence to help us eat? Yeah, Charlie Chaplin is eating now, is doing. It's a program sequence of actions for 
serving a human being. But remember, what is a machine? From the hammer that we first have, the levers, the washing machine, it's a tool for human beings. It's designed to help the human being, right? To help him eat program sequence of motion according to, I should eat this first, then breakfast. But like in anything else, I become tired, right? And perhaps I can't keep up with the machine, but that machine doesn't care, right? This is an exaggeration. And what's happening here? We become slaves to machines, right? And that's not supposed to happen. That's not what robotics is all about. Let's not, let's not forget robotics is not to replace us. It's not to control us. It's the other way around. It's the best machine to help us. We are always in control, right? Many of the successful robotic applications today are designed, I'm sad to say, with that bias in mind, in factories that are designed for robots. In factories designed for robots, you have to make sure everything is clean, exactly, things are exactly where they're supposed to be, very certain, right? But once human beings go into this environment, you mess up the place, right? And, and robot is not able to work very well right now. So the challenge is how to make the robot get it out of the factory to our everyday lives where the robot adapts to the environment. This is, more, this is very important. If you visit my office, more so if you visit my home, you can see how messy it is and how hard it is to automate that place, right? But I don't care if a robot can help me in such a condition I don't want to compromise my living standard because of a robot is there. That's why in all my work in robotics, like in the driverless car, I ha we have our driverless car working without relying on GPS, without relying on communicating with the traffic light. We don't need to modify the environment because the environment is built for human beings. So that's a challenge. So how can we bring the robot out of the factory to everyday lives without compromising how we live? And the robot is an excellent tool to help us be happier, live stress, less stressful lives. So robotics is moving away from the upper left where you have program sequence of motion to things closer to human being. The robot is embracing the human, a wearable robot, so I can, I can walk without getting tired. I can carry heavier things. Before I retire, before I go to the next world, I want to wear something so I can climb mountains without getting tired. And if I, I won't fall, if I fall, I just fly <laughs> and land nicely. It would be nice. That's robotics, right? The robot in the lower right, inside the human being doing surgery under remote control. The doctor is still there behind somewhere, seeing what the robot is seeing inside the, the human body, bypass surgery, for example, right? Upper right is a robot can climb up stairs can go up any unstructured environment. There's no top, there's not bottom. Under remote control, still under full control of the human being, right? But with certain level of intelligence, right? it's like an ultimate slave for the machine, for the human, right? Okay. Among all the robotic applications, a self-driving car perhaps is the most interesting to me why, right? Because I want to be mobile. Because as I grow older, I won't be able to ride my scooter anymore, right? And as I grow older, I have more friends who are father parents who are retiring or have retired. They're alone at their home. It's not so bad in Singapore because you have a very good transportation system. If you're living in the United States, for example, you live in a home without a car, you're helpless. So what do they do? I want to go to the library. I want to go shopping. I want to visit my friends. You call, they will call their kids. Can you come pick me up All right, to do that? But sometimes they won't do that. They won't, I don't want to bother my kids for doing that. I want to be independent. Wouldn't it be so nice? Every time I need a car, I just call it. Within five minutes, it's with me, helping me, right? And I ride it. It takes me to the destination. And while inside the car, I can do many other things, right? It, really nice, it gives independence to people, and independence means mobility. Not only, I don't need to wait to, to be old, right? Right now, I can do that right now, right? I can be sure, I can be on time, right? Anytime with this. Now, if you look at robotics, right? Autonomous vehicles, right? 
it affects everybody, whether you're young or old, whether you're rich or poor, the whole wide sector, right? And many people take for granted, maybe, or think autonomous vehicles is it safe. Ironically, we work on autonomous vehicles because of safety. Majority, more than 95% of accidents are caused by human errors. Yes, that's understandable, right? Driving a car is stressful, you're not perfect. A computer is always doing the same, repeatable. You overtake a driverless car, it doesn't care, it doesn't get angry, no revenge, it doesn't get emotional. It has sensors that sees everything. It not only sees you, I know if I'm a robot, I know how far each of you are around me. It gives much more information that's always there with redundancy. We have two computers there, if the computer fails, now you know that happens, it hangs, right? We have another backup computer that makes sure everything is working. So it's really safety is one concern, one of the motivations. Of course, if you're too old to drive anymore, you still want to provide accessibility. If you have too much to drink in the evening, the driver has does to you. If you're too young, your kids does it to you. You can do that. These are uh, videos that we're having fun in Utah. This is actually uh, maybe three years ago. If you've seen here, you see our students uh, doing makeup, you know, while driving the car, you know, productivity. Imagine how much time we spend in a car driving. Driving is one of the things we, we are wasting our precious time. And if the traffic is bad, we get stressed. Can you imagine if the car has a screen? Take away the steering wheel, it's like a lounge, like the limousine type behind. You're all sitting down, having coffee, checking your internet, watching movie. Saving one hour of time checking my email relieves one hour of time, my me time at home, to have with my loved ones. Now I get very irritated if I have unread emails. It piles up, it days, right? So at home I try to catch up with it. But it's very tired, I, I, my, my family is complaining, right? So that's the motivation. Of course, with autonomous cars, it drives itself very well, saves fuel efficiency, it's electric, it saves the environment. We're moving to a car light society. Car light society means, can we not worship our cars? Our cars are tools for us. But many times I see neighbors polishing, kissing the car, <laughs> doing all this. We're worshiping it. So can we get away from worshiping the car? If I can guarantee within five minutes you have the car to you, gives you to the exact destination you want, plus minus five minutes, you don't arrive too early, you don't arrive too late, you take the car, you get off, the car serves its next, like a driverless taxi, next passenger, would you still want to own a car? You don't need to worry about parking. Ironically, for me, the answer is yes, because it's fun driving, right? But I only want to drive for recreation, driving far to places where I can speed. I won't tell you where. <laughs> yeah. But it's fun, but not for everyday commute. Not for everyday commute. So this is our engineering campus. There's a roads for cars. But then, as you can see here, getting to this place, building to building, the car don't give you to the doorstep, right? So you still need something like my scooter or something like a buggy that's autonomous. So here we have two cars, uh, Scott's Shared Computer Operated Transport and an autonomous golf cart with names also of all my students. Sir. Each one has a name. So the idea is the car brings you to the nearest drop-off point and you take a smaller version of a car, a buggy, to bring you to the building itself, right? We call it a multi-class mobility, like here. This is in university town. Here, you take it from the Create building, the passenger, and uses a mobile phone application. Once you book it, it's within your reach within five minutes. You key in your PIN number, and it goes, uh, and goes to the, the building you want to get into, right? So what's next in this, sir? Driverless cars, right? That's one. I always say robotics, there are three Ds yeah, that humans ought not to do. Four Ds, actually, sorry, four Ds. Demanding, demeaning, dirty, dangerous, right? Can we get robots to do this? I'm going to make it a fifth D. What's the five? five? Driving, right? These are not, we should not waste time on that, right? 
the future really awaits us. I challenge you, I inspire you, I hope I can inspire you to see today all information is available. We can have robotic devices, technology available through the internet. I wish I had this when I was your age. And you can pick, pick, pick up, build new ideas, be creative. You don't need to wait to finish your university degrees to start doing things. The Lego Mindstorms, for example, many other robotic devices, you can build computers, robots, for kids, right, that do that, right? You can have one day, we'll have mobility any way we want to go. We can have a, a suit. That, and we also need companionship. Huh? Believe it or not, that's a robot. Of course, that opens up some ethical issues, but my view is if I'm not hurting anybody, I'm happy, he's happy, everybody's happy, why not? Right? A, a, a companion that will help my social needs, emotional needs, and my physical needs. That's the ultimate. Can you imagine the world, will, what the world will be? And you have a role to play in that. You can do it. Be observant, see how things are going. Observe simple things like this, right? In science, for example, let's observe, right? If I boil water, it becomes steam. How does it become steam? Because heat goes into the water, right? Can I make that something useful? Ah, if I can build, can I, if I can find a material that boils in the room temperature, what does it mean? It absorbs heat from the environment. And that's called a refrigerant, right? But then if it loses the heat, if, 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 if it boils, the refrigerant disappears, the liquid becomes gas. But can I trap it in a piping system and pump it back behind the house, compress it back to liquid? Then after that, pump, pump up the liquid to the home where it's cool, let it evaporate. Then you have the air conditioner, right? Somebody thought of that by observing nature, right? That's why in the split unit, you call that thing inside your living room evaporator because it evaporates it. And you call that thing that's noisy compressor because it compresses it. Now, so look at nature, observe, and think how we can do, use those basic laws to improve our quality of life. Robotics allows us to alter nature, right? Can we make it behave differently because of the computer? That's the controlling how physics would naturally work because you have a machine controlling it. And with that, it opens up much more opportunities. And the world is out there for all of you to make a contribution. Let's do it together. Thank you very much.